Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here, and tonight we're going to talk about the MoFo, I mean MoFi debacle. Debacle? Anyway, more on that in just a minute. Okay, so first of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you who have sent out your well wishes to me. If you didn't know, I was off for surgery and I've been in recovery for the last week, and I am so glad to be back shooting videos for you guys. I want to thank all of you for continuing to share my videos while I've been off. The channel has grown tremendously. Thank you so much, folks. That's you. That's not me. I also want to thank my wife and my daughter who have helped me through convalescence here in the last week. My daughter even helped me set up the lights for tonight's video, something that is just beyond my capabilities right now. All right, so what do I mean by the MoFi debacle? What the hell is a MoFi anyway? Now, unless you've been living under a rock this week, if you are at all interested in uh, collecting vinyl or have uh, even a small collection of vinyl records or have been uh, even contemplating going vinyl in the future, this has been a huge story on the internet. Now, MoFi, of course, stands for Mobile Fidelity, a company that has been mastering and pressing high-end records for high-end prices, well, for decades. Now, the literature and the website data supplied by the company generally gave your average buyer of their records the idea that they used a specialized Studer mastering recorder with special electronics built by a genius, really, and that they would go directly and transfer from the masters onto this Studer machine. And then that Studer, with its advanced circuitry, could pick up nuances that other machines can't, and generally speaking, producing a much superior record. Okay, so what's the problem with that? Actually, I have no problem with that at all. But you know, it was Mike who had some connections to the company or at least knew people who knew some, well, dirt on the company. You know, the first thing that kind of alerted him was the fact that the company had announced that they were going to remix the album Thriller. Now, first of all, Thriller by Michael Jackson has got to be one of the biggest selling albums of all time, if not the biggest selling album of all time. The masters for this album are precious, folks. They don't just let anybody continually listen to these tapes. That produces wear and tear. And he started reasoning, wait a minute, they're saying they're going to put out 40,000 copies. Then he started doing the math. He's a reasonably educated audiophile. And then he started thinking, hey, wait a minute. You only get about a thousand pressings off of each recording. How many times were they gonna put this master through its paces? Then he started hearing from people he knew in the industry that actually this was going to be a digital transfer from a digital master. Well, he tried to get a hold of Mobile Fidelity several times with very little success. But his video caught on and either they finally got a hold of him and he conducted an interview with their three main engineers, all engineers with really solid names in the industry. They've been doing this for decades, folks. So here's the debacle. Did MoFi lie? in their literature concerning their releases. Now, if further information informed us that, well, this was a special transfer, this was different than what they usually do, I don't think this company would be in any trouble right now, not the trouble that they're gonna find themselves in anyway. You see, through further investigation, we find out that MoFi has been releasing as what many people thought, or incorrectly, assumed were analog transfers. You know, like we talked about, from the master tape to that Studer mastering machine. Now, during the course of this interview with these guys, Mike would ask them things like, well, did you actually do this from a master to a master? And they would begrudgingly say, well, no, 
we took our, you know, AMD converters and, and went there and did a transfer from a digital master. In other words, a DSD transfer. And you know, as I've watched other channels sink their teeth into this whole situation, it seems to me everybody's a bit reticent to call these guys a liar. So let's ask the question, did MoFi lie? Well, you know, let's say I was untruthful about something with my wife. Say I was out with the boys carousing and I was in late that night. I didn't think about calling her. And the next morning uh, we woke up and she assumed that I had been working overtime at work. She might even make a little mention of it. I do a grunt to acknowledge that she has said something to me and I'm out of the woods, right? I haven't actually lied or have I? You know, just deleting all the details of where I was all along is a freaking lie, folks. Now, MoFi has been known as a company where audiophiles have gone to get what they thought were honest-to-God analog master recordings. But here's where it gets interesting. You see, a whole lot of those audiophiles praised these recordings assuming they were analog, and we're finding out they're not. They're DSD, digital transfers, nothing more. Now, I went and looked at several channels that have been covering this. Uh, some of them have been involved in this whole process for a couple of years. One young audiophile even recognizing that the coveted Miles Davis album didn't quite sound as good as another one that he found that he knew that was mastered analog. So, of course, there are audiophiles and there are audiophiles. I can only imagine, you know, those audiophiles that you've met at cocktail parties or get-togethers, you know. You know, they're the ones with the hot stereo system, the special tone arm on their, you know, turntable that they got from Germany. And they're there to enlighten us like wine connoisseurs as to the majesty of analog. Oops. You know, those people remind me of the same kind of fans I've talked about in past videos. You know, the fans will go see a band with one or two original members, in some cases no original members, yet touring under that band name and only going to those concerts for the bragging rights. Now, is there a difference between analog and digital? Yes, of course there is a difference. But you know, the converters for the DSD files have gotten so good. The electronics have gotten so good. Is this just because it's digital, at least under certain circumstances, just as valid and perhaps even sometimes superior sounding than the original analog source? So that gets us back to the title that you clicked on for this video. Is analog versus digital even an issue anymore? Well, for the moment, I think there is an issue here. And I think we need to always go to the analog source if there is an analog source. After all, so many classic great albums were recorded as digital masterpieces. Paul McCartney's Tug of War, Brothers in Arms. In fact, those two recordings were hailed as digital masterpieces. Now you know why in the painting of Paul McCartney on that Tug of War album, there are squares. It was to represent the digital media that that album, a classic I might add, was recorded in. You know, as a musician, I love the warmth that a good tube amp can provide. But I also love the clarity of a great digital recording. To me, the media chosen to record any recording project is only part of the artistic brushstroke. There is art in recording music digitally and then mastering it digitally. And of course, the artistic approach in analog has already historically been proven sound. So here's my question to you guys. If MoFi's records, these great records that have for years been not only included in the audiophile community, but praised as great 
analog records if they really are that good. After all, these are people who listen to music on serious systems. Who the hell are we to argue with the results? You know, to me, this whole mess is actually good news for us. We have an opportunity now. These mastering houses, they've got to be more forthright in exactly how they attain their sound that they get on their records, and then we, as an audience, will judge whether we want to pay X amount of dollars for such and such and such and such. I don't care how expensive and how wonderful your equipment is, a DSD transfer is a hell of a lot less expensive than going from an original analog master into their famous Studer machine. They need to clearly identify whether this is a master mastered on their Studer machine or if it's a DSD transfer. And then we need to, as a group, listen to the music again and make a decision for ourselves. You know, I think in the end, we're gonna find a little room for both. All right, guys, there is a ton more I could say on this subject, the whole process, this so-called one-step process that's actually a three-step process from their original three-step process, which was actually a five-step process. We could get into that. Let me know in the comments if you want further information on this subject. If you enjoyed tonight's video, as I said, please feel free to share it. Give us a thumbs up. It helps channel growth, of course. And I just want to say, as always, the names in front of me are all brand new subscribers. And you know what? All they had to do was hit that subscribe to the tribe button, hit that top bell notification, and guess what? All of them have been notified. They're seeing my videos the very second they come out. All right, guys, that about covers it for tonight. I'm Michael Noland, and this is The Bottom Line, and I'll see you in my next video.